This conference will now be recorded. Okay, we're about to, we got like a minute, but I got, I have a crack team here, so they're, they're getting me started ahead. I think we're getting better at hitting that button before you start talking. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't interrupt you once you get started. Uh, it doesn't really ruin my flow too much if we press the button afterwards, but depends. Okay, it is now three o'clock. If you haven't already, please go ahead and put your um, library affiliation in the chat, just so we kind of know where you are in the state. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Claudia Holland, Chief of the Bureau of Library Development in the Division of Library and Information Services. It's great to have you on the call today. Uh, we're going to talk about outdoor programming ideas and I don't know about where you are but it's beautiful here today so it's a good it's a good um, time to talk. Uh, I know that you know based on the short amount of time that I have been with DLIS which is almost two years now um, uh, I have noticed how incredibly creative the library staff in Florida are. You guys offer a multitude of fun and educational activities, both inside and outside the library for all ages. Uh, and that's that you should be lauded for that. With our continued need to offer programs that encourage social distancing, this does seem like kind of a good time to talk about what folks are going to be doing uh, this year and maybe even continuing after we get out of this crazy time, whenever that may be. Uh, these discussions are for you, so if we decide to veer off topic, that is completely fine. Uh, we, we just want you all to be able to share and feel comfortable sharing and talking about whatever you would like to. Uh, let me just take a minute to uh, mention a few housekeeping items before we get started. We have muted everyone, you probably can tell that uh, at this point, but we'll unmute you once the discussion begins. Please mute yourself until you're ready to talk in case you have that errant dog barking or child crying or phone ringing. Um, anyway, wherever you are, it might be a good idea to, to mute until you're ready to talk. If you don't have a mic, obviously we do have chat and we'd love to hear from you no matter whether you just can chat. Uh, we'll be monitoring it for questions uh, that you'd like to pose to the group if you can't uh, actually, or if you feel more comfortable uh, chatting than um, verbalizing. If you get dropped or if you have bandwidth, you have phone off your webcam until you want to speak. Uh, you may, of course, speak without using your webcam, uh, but I know that everyone would like to see you as well as hear you. The session will be recorded and made available on our YouTube channel for you to refer to later if you'd like and for those who are unable to join us today. <clears throat> for those who have been, you know, who have come to some of these uh, DLIS discussions, um, I tend to like to invite staff from a few libraries in Florida to talk about the topic of the day because really, to me, you're, you're going to benefit more from listening to them and, and sort of, you know, them sparking the conversation from hearing from them directly. You know, especially if they've experimented with or they already have a successful program in place that you want to hear about. So today it gives me great pleasure to introduce, uh, I think, I, I don't know if it's Sabrina. Sabrina, are you on today? Um, if it's not Sabrina, it may be um, Melissa from uh, Winter Park Library. Yes, uh, this is Melissa. Talk about I am here. <laughs> Hi. Hey, Melissa. Thank you for being here. And they're going to talk about some uh, really cool stuff they're doing in their library. And um, also, um, uh, Rebecca Sahar is here from Wakala County. Public Library. Uh, she's going to also share some outdoor programming experiences that they have and that they have in place and having 
you know, I think a good time doing. Um, so I hope you feel comfortable talking, asking questions, and then and not making me talk. <laughs> so let's get started. Why don't we start with um, something that, a couple of things that are going on, I'm just so impressed by. Uh, Rebecca, the drive up bingo that y'all are doing, what is that all about? So last year um, when COVID hit, um, you know, we were trying to figure out things that we could do that would still allow us to interact with our patrons. Um, because we do have a lot of patrons that live in our county that don't have access to internet. So they're not going to be able to watch our virtual programming and, and, and come and, and figure out what we're doing on Facebook because they just, they don't have access. Um, and a lot of people around here still don't have smartphones. A lot of them who don't have internet do have smartphones so they can access it that way, but there's still a large number that don't. Um, so we, once we were back into at least the library, we're like, I started thinking, and we were talking about drive-in story time, and I'm like, how would we show them the book? And I, I finally looked at them and said, I said, I've been doing bingo here at the library. Why don't we do drive-in bingo? We can hand out the cards and all we need is a mic. And um, so that's kind of how it was born. Um, but we knew our parking lot wasn't big enough. So we've been meeting and having it at our community center, which is more centrally located than our library. And um, it's been pretty, pretty popular. Even now that we're open more than um, a lot of other places are. Um, but it has still been a really popular program because we have people that, you know, are immune compromised and still are limiting their time in the library. Um, and to really kind of make it work, someone's having problems with sound. So, okay. Casey got it. Um, well, don't worry. We'll take care of it. Um, but to, to kind of get it kick-started, uh, it started in the trunk of my car at the parking lot um, with <laughs> one of my other coworkers running around with a wagon full of prizes that were donated and a volunteer who would come and keep track of the numbers with a Sharpie and a laminated sheet of uh, what numbers we had called so that we could actually check to make sure that they had gotten bingo. Um, and it kind of, it, it progressed from just having a microphone and a speaker um, to buying a FM transmitter so that they could hear us in their cars because we were having so many people that they couldn't hear just through the speaker and the microphone anymore because they were so spread out through the parking lot trying to make sure everyone had distance in between them. Um, and it, it just kind of grew. Um, we actually just had bingo this past Friday and we did, we actually did a St. Patrick's Day bingo <coughs> and everyone laughed the whole time we did it. Uh, and it was silly and it was free. I found it on the internet and it was, it was just so much fun. Um, uh -huh. and then we started having issues with prizes. Yes, I will link the one that I used. I have it. Um, so I kind of, we, we have kind of a connection with our Dollar General. And I don't know how many of you guys know this, but Dollar General has a literacy program for summer reading and for schools and all kinds of other things. Um, but one of our coworkers has a relative that's a manager and at some point during the year, they have a point where they just have to throw away a bunch of inventory because they can't sell it. They've marked it down. It didn't sell on clearance. And um, so they started calling us. So now we're getting prizes donated that we're not having to spend our money on and that we're able to have really decent prizes for our kids and our families that come out. Um, and it's just kind of been a big hit. Sounds wonderful. Who, now, so Dollar General has sort of been a partner. 
Yeah, they they've they have, and they they haven't asked us to really advertise that. But when I'm talking to the library groups, I'm like, yeah. always go and talk to your local people um, because you never know what they'll offer you. So, um, <laughs> good point. So, but they they've they've been very helpful. And then what we end up doing is they usually have so many um, things that we end up keeping about half and donating half of what they give us to our local Operation Santa. So there's usually too much for us to keep just for us, which is the other reason they call us because they know we can redistribute it to the other people. So. I see. Um, well, that sounds fun. Melissa, so you get all we, ages? <laughs> it's all ages. Um, Melissa asked, how often do we uh, do we offer the pro bingo program? And it's usually about twice a month, kind of depending on where holidays and things fall. Um, or in this case, spring break, because because of spring break, we won't have another bingo this month. We'll have it in April. So. I see. Great. Sounds very fun. <laughs> I might come play, huh? You should. I'm close no, enough. You just stay in your car. <laughs> right. Um, I'm going to come back to you in just a minute. Uh, sure. Rebecca, I, I'd like to, to go to Melissa now, who's going to talk about the bike program at um, uh, Winter Park. Melissa, are you on? Yes. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, so I'll just throw out some general information about the bike program and then y'all can chime in with questions. But we've had our bike checkout program at Winter Park since 2014. We were able to start that program through a small grant that we received from a local health organization. We applied for a grant specifically for that program. And then at the start of that, we were able to purchase eight bikes. We purchased seven single rider cruiser style bikes and one tandem bike for two and we were also able to purchase helmets and bike locks and then once we were able to do that we actually worked with an eagle scout as part of his eagle scout project and he built us an awning and got bike racks for us so that we could store the bikes outside the building obviously we didn't have a place inside the building and we were a little worried with the elements being what they are here in Central Florida about um, not having them under, under any kind of protection. Um, so once we did that, we had a couple of attorneys on our board who actually helped us create waiver forms for folks to sign when they checked out the bikes, just acknowledging if there was any injury or anything like that, that of course the library wasn't responsible. And the bikes are a same day checkout once folks have filled that waiver out one time, they don't have to do it again. Helmets are optional. Um, since we've had the bikes, we've only offered that to folks who are over the age of 18. We did have some concerns from our attorneys that there was some liability involved if minors were gonna be using the bikes. So folks have to just show their ID and their library card to verify their age. Um, again, fill out a waiver if they've never done so, and then they can check out the bikes. And we've worked with the city to have some uh, trail handouts available for folks so they can see where they can go close by and ride around. And then we actually are located next door to the Alfond Inn. It's a really nice hotel in Winter Park. And we have a partnership with them where their guests can actually show their room keys and uh, check out bikes for free. So that's a really nice perk for folks who are out of town visiting the area who want to uh, go exploring. Um, and the bikes have been super popular. They've checked out over a thousand times since we started the program. We have not offered them during COVID because we had some concerns around obviously close contact, contamination, things like that. But we're hoping to reintroduce the program um, late spring, early summer and oh that's great we have a question about repair um so we work with a local bike mechanic who comes to us he's a mobile bike mechanic he comes with his trailer and he services the bikes quarterly for us 
Um, and it's very reasonable. He does a great job. He actually works with um, the Disney police force. He's very well thought of in the community um, and we don't have to take them anywhere. So that's really nice for us. He does everything he needs to do on site, um, brings spare parts, things like that. Um, and those are just kind of the main things, but I'm happy to answer questions or share more information if folks want to hear more about something specific. <coughs> Anybody have any questions for either Rebecca or Melissa, oh, excuse me, uh, for, uh, to talk about these two programs? I'm impressed. Are y'all going to add more bikes, do you think? That's a good question. You know, one thing is, um, I'll just mention this as an aside. I know from different folks that have reached out to me around the country to ask about the bike program, there were a lot of questions about damage or loss, and we've never had a bike stolen. Um, we did have a couple of pieces of bikes get taken, but we have uh, security cameras on them now, so that was not an issue anymore. Um, and then we have, um, of course, bikes are only going to last for so long so we do have plans to replace the bikes in the next couple of years um, and maybe even get an electric bike model which would be a little bit easier for some folks because our bikes are just cruiser style bikes they don't have gears they don't have any type of a motor um, so that can be pretty intensive for folks that aren't used to riding a bike mm -hmm. but we're happy with the number that we have at this point the um the number that we started with worked well for us. We never had a time where we couldn't keep up with the demand. That's wonderful. And don't, don't y'all also do like historic tour, somebody, somebody, you partner with somebody to do historic tours, is that correct? Yeah, we've incorporated the bikes into our curriculum. So we have an archivist in the library. We have a small collection of local history and our archivist actually works with our community librarian and they've done some bike tours around the city and gone to some historic spots. And that has been a super popular event that we've offered on a rotating basis. And, you know, it's really nice for folks to just come to the library, check out a bike, and then they go around town and explore. Sounds fun. I see there's a question. Um, I didn't state how we pass out the bingo cards. That, that's on me. So what we do is we require everyone to stay either at least in their parking space or in their car. And we wear masks and gloves in order to pass out bingo cards and pencils if they don't have something to write with. We prefer pencils, which we don't mind providing so that they can erase and reuse their cards because we play about 10 rounds. Um, we do offer to replace their cards a couple of times during play since we play for about an hour. Um, and that way, if we have one little car that comes every time and they finally won a round of bingo. I think they've come 10 times, they've never won, and they finally won a round of bingo this time, because, but they kept asking for cards because it was like, I'm gonna give them however many cards they want because I want them to win this time. So that was a good question. I'm sorry I, I missed that when I was uh, answering earlier. I know people are doing story walks out there. Uh, Rebecca, I know y'all are doing that and I, I, it's hard to keep up with who all is in the room, but uh, if you're doing story walks, uh, please share that information. Here's a question. Yes. This is Go Oyuki Paletz. I'm with the Booker Town Public Library. We actually have two story walks. Um, the first one we rolled out last summer um, and it was funded by our friends organization and um, was very well received. I mean, it was a little hot when we rolled it out. Um, mm -hmm. but right now, we rolled out our second one um, in, our, in a, in a Serenal Glade Preserve. You know, that one is um, really close to a playground. So the books that we choose for that one are a little bit younger in age. Um, and that one too was funded by our friends. The first one we partnered with Palm Beach County 
uh, I believe it was land management resources and they were really wonderful and they actually printed the books on the really nice UV um, printing so the color stayed well um, and they're printing it for free yay partnerships so um, that was the best part about that we do um, request the books um, in advance you know just to make sure that we're able to reprint them um, the first one we did we cut out and you know hodgepodge but it, it just like it looked nice but it the colors faded so we're really glad with the uv printing but um it's really great we've gotten a lot of good press from the community um all ages even adults you know are looking forward so we have it on a um bi-monthly we change it every two months to uh, a new book at each location so it's been very well received so does everybody know what a story walk is i have not ever participated at one. So I'm always interested in hearing how you set them up and how you decide on the books. Yeah, so these, someone asked, are these permanent installations? And they are, we did the ones from Barking Dogs. So it's a whole metal post. And then um, there's like a, you know, a frame with a plexiglass that you just switch it out. Now you can do it where you can, um, you know, you just print out the page laminate and put in a little paint stick, you know, so you, so you can do it different ways. I've seen, um, I think uh, the Princeton Public Library, they do it on different windows for their local businesses. So there's different ways. It's very flexible. Um, but again, you know, we had it, uh, our friends have deep pockets that so we're always looking for projects for them to do. So this one was an easy one um, that they liked. So, and again, the first one took a little bit longer, but the second one that we pitched them, we pitched it in December and it was up at the end of January. So, you know, we already had the bodies and the resources um, and they're very, you know, the, the, the thing that takes the longest is getting the approval back from the publishers. <laughs> so, but that's about it. Now we're just on a, on a roll. That's awesome. I know others are doing story walks. Rebecca, you wanna share what y'all are doing? So I know there's a lot of flexibility too when it comes to um, what books you're gonna do. And um, I know you guys are asking specific permission from each publisher, um, but based on the information from the original story walk, as long as you buy two copies of the books and you don't, edit anything you have to you can tape them together and put them all on a page um but as long as you don't edit them and you buy two copies of the book and you have one in circulation i think are the requirements um to take them apart and use the actual book for the story walk whereas you guys are actually having them printed out i think is what you said on the uv Correct. Yeah. So the first yeah. time we did buy multiple copies um, and we just cut them up. But because we are having them reprinted, we right. are going through that extra step to making sure we have permissions. And then in addition to that, we add, um, you know, little things like count how many uh, butterflies are, you know, jump like the frogs, yeah. whatever. So we're trying to do it a little bit more interactive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we, we, we add that interactive element, too. Um, so we 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 have the same exhibit signs that they do through barking dog that our friends agreed to purchase and fund um and they're also funding the books that we're getting but we're doing the two copies of the book where you take the book apart and then we're taking the book to go and get it laminated so that it stays um we can reuse it and hopefully it does we Unfortunately, I don't think it's UV, so it will eventually fade and we'll have to remake it, but we've had I think three different stories out already and maybe four. I'm kind of lost at this point because we've done so many. I just don't remember. Um, but we're changing them almost every month. Um, and ours is located, we have a park in the middle of town that has a walking trail around it. So it's stationed periodically around the trail so that they can read the story as they walk around the park. Um, but it's been interesting. Um, I know we haven't done an adult book. We've all done, uh, we've only done kids books. Um, the last, the book that's currently out is Ada Twist Scientist. And one of, we, some of the questions we ask for the books are for parents though, because in Ada Twist, there's one point where they're looking at the story and the, they're all trying to figure out what's going on in the book. And the question is, what is she trying to figure out? And you see the picture of a chicken and equals and an egg, and they're trying to figure out which comes first, the chicken or the egg, which a kid's not gonna get, but a parent would. So we try to engage both, so. 
<laughs> fun. Anyone else want to share about their story walks or something similar? Deborah says that graphic novels might be good. Yeah, I agree. That would be good. Oh, and Deb says uh, she's been inspired to think about a poetry walk. I think that's a lovely idea. I think even, you know, art, uh, you can, uh, the, the sky's kind of the limit with a story walk, I guess, uh, other than, um, I think if you had a really detailed, like I wouldn't put a Dickens book out there, maybe, unless it was a, you know, a graphic novel or a comic book or something like that, but uh, something uh, fun to engage a lot of different people is a good idea. Uh, Casey says a common question we get in the flip sessions is how people are counting stats for story walks. Anybody got any ideas on that? Nope. Casey, do you want to chime in here? I can. I was hoping that um, it might have sparked somebody else to talk, um, which Rebecca put in the chat. Um, which Rebecca, I'll let, I'm, I'm, I'm going into CE mode here, but, but you are perfectly capable of voicing yourself what you just wrote if you want to talk about that. Um, and there was a question about what the goal of a story walk was. So I was going to say too, if somebody wanted to actually talk about what a story walk is, so that way people who may not know that term. I know for as far as stats, and I, I did, I put it in the chat. Um, we use QR codes where we link a video of us reading the book so that if they don't, if they can't read very well or if they struggle with reading and they have a smartphone or something, especially there are some parents around here that are literate, but they are tech literate um, and are able to scan a QR code and have either me or um, our other children's person read Amy? the book to them. Hey. And um, uh, well, um, uh, <laughs> the guy who's uh, do it. See there we go. <laughs> um, so we track it through the video, um, which not everyone scans it when they go through. Um, we've also, I've also talked to other people that have story walks that have a QR code with a registration, like please register so that we know how many people have participated. I've also seen portable story walks where they physically stay there for X amount of hours and count how many people go through for the story walk. As well as I've seen permanent installations that have a waterproof box at the beginning or end that have a guest book that asks people to physically write their name in it. So there, there's ways to get stats. Um, I know as far as we're concerned, it, it's a passive program. It does count as a stat, but we're not freaking out to get the numbers for it because we think it's more important for our community than for our numbers, um, but we do kind of have a general idea of about how many people are out at our park a day. So we kind of know how many people have the opportunity to see it. It's kind of where we're at with it. So it's it kind of just depends on our libraries gets to be a little bit more liberal with that, whereas I know some libraries have to have the exact stats for certain things. I know it just kind of depends on where you are. And then the goal of the story walk, I guess, is to promote literacy and to reach your patrons in a new environment and encourage them to come to the library and maybe check out the book that they had at the park that everyone loved. So that that's the goal for me is we want to reach as many people as we can. Yeah. It sounds fun. Um, sure. Switching gears a little bit, uh, I know oh, that there's been a lot of interest in uh, seed libraries, and some some libraries are already in place with their seed libraries, and others are thinking about them. Um, I don't know if Catherine is here from Pasco. Catherine, are you on? If not, 
I'm going to pick on our, our friends from Leon County or others who I know have seed libraries. I know I've been to a seed library and I love it because I like to garden. <laughs> Um, and it's just so much fun to see what seeds are being offered. Um, some libraries focus on non-invasive species, um, you know, native species. Um, some people focus on vegetables. They have cooking classes affiliated with them. They have, you know, nutrition classes and so on. So who out there is doing seed libraries? And if you aren't, are you interested in, in learning more about them? Y'all are a quiet bunch today. <laughs> Sarah says that her locations are thinking of starting a seed library and looking forward to it. Hi, this is Doris from um, the Acreage Branch Library of Palm Beach County. And Hi. we have a gardening program uh, that we always had someone come in and speak about certain things for gardening, for you know, growing your vegetables and fruits. And now we're doing it by Zoom and it's still very popular. And we also, uh, although we don't have a library, but we have a first come first serve uh, of seeds for growing fruits and vegetables, as well as um, seedlings. Wow. So your partnerships are with um, garden clubs? Is that what you said? Actually, um, ours is with um, IFAS, um, so our, our Mounts Botanical Garden here, um, we have folks from there um, speak about, come speak about, uh, you know, the, where it's composting or when's the right time to plant this vegetable or this fruit or what, so, what, what have you. But we also have at our branch, we're um, kind of in a, a farming type community, so um, we have quite a few experts on our own staff uh, that will speak about uh, and answer questions regarding um, any in anything about gardening. Mm -hmm. And then they offer up uh, seedlings from their own gardens for folks to take home. And then we uh, get free seeds donated from, from different places. And mm -hmm. that's worked out really well. It's wonderful. There are a lot of people who are saying they, they have uh, seed libraries, New Smyrna, uh, James Weldon Johnson Library, Winter Park is planning to launch a seed library, um, Palm Beach County's Jupiter Branch did a seed swap last year before things shut down, so that's kind of fun. Um, Rebecca says she's there, have a seed library, but they're having some issues with it. You want to share the issues? So, no, okay, <laughs> not issues they want to share. Sometimes it's good to know what the downside is in case, you know, uh, you need to sort of be in the know. Uh, Teresa Steinmeier, she says, we did a food scrap gardening virtual program for children. That was nice because children could use whatever food scraps they had at home and learn how to replant, regrow them. That is fun. Teresa, you want to talk a little more about that? Sure. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Um, that was a good one. Um, we did it right when things shut down. So it was one of our first virtual programs, I think. And I didn't really tell in the blurb like what they needed with supplies. I kind of just left it to them to gather whatever they had lying around. So kids had pieces of ginger and garlic or um, bits of lettuce. Lettuce regrows really nicely. So everyone had their like romaine lettuce stubs. <laughs> so it wound up in the garbage and we learned how to replant them and what would regrow and what wouldn't. So things like celery and like carrots will regrow the tops, but not the actual like carrot root, but you could still eat the tops. So it was, it was really well, well received, it was nice. Sounds wonderful. Anybody else? Jade has, she doesn't have audio on her computer, but she works at Pasco Libraries with Catherine. She says our seed library is doing really well. We offer mostly veggies and herbs with fruits and flowers as well. 
In the past, we've offered herbside pickup, <laughs> a play on curbside. <laughs> Thank you for explaining that to me. To pick herbs fresh from our garden for patrons to pick up near holidays for their meals. What a great idea. So that goes back to me to, um, and Leon County also has a seed library that they offer in spring and fall. Um, what spinoffs? I mean, they're the spinoffs from having a seed library are like exponential, I would think. Um, I know that um, when I visited Volusia one time, they were doing a cooking class for teens. I mean, what a great way to get teens involved and there's just so many ways you can go with this. Uh, Leon County Fort Braden branch has a community garden and the University of Florida IFES partners to offer programs virtual during COVID, yeah. Rebe Rebecca asks, do you provide the seeds yourselves or do you partner with others? Uh, Leon County gives out three packets per card per month just to grow. We don't collect seeds at the end of the season. Um, uh, Home Depot and a local plant nursery donated seeds. Uh, plant swap, somebody likes that idea. I like that idea too. I want to be part of that. <laughs> Uh, I have some plants in my yard I want to get rid of, so can I swap with somebody? Um, and and then uh, Lily says, we also have one patron who comes every Tuesday and Thursday to bring about 10 plant clip clippings from her garden for all of our patrons to take. What a wonderful idea. Huh. Anybody else have anything they want to share on the, the gardening slash um, seed library front? So I'm curious, what, what have you tried, and Rebecca, you don't have to answer this question, obviously, what have you tried that it didn't work out for whatever reason for, a, for an outdoor program? Um, hey, Frank, that looks like somebody's trying to um, compete for some business, huh? <laughs> Because do they have a whistling that we're changing? <laughs> um, Jay says hey, Susan, an idea. just to replace it. Yeah. Susan, I don't know if you know this or not, but you are currently unmuted, so we can hear your conversation in the room. <laughs> um, Jade says we had an idea to donate our harvest to local food banks but that's dependent on the harvest, true enough. So if you didn't have a bomb, how about did, what's your most popular outdoor program? Or do you have one in place yet or that you are thinking about starting? Let's hear your ideas. Michelle has shared that the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services offers grants to schools and other nonprofit ed educational organizations for beginning a community garden. Who has a garden outside their library? I mean, we were just talking about that, but some people may have a garden or a playground outside your library. This is Melissa at the Winter Park Library, and we have um, grow boxes outside our building that we got a grant for. Mm -hmm. And we've done quite a few things curriculum wise for our classes and events with those everything from tween or teen gardening classes to now we're doing a community plant exchange. And kind of similar to what we were talking about with the seed libraries, folks can bring in a plant and then get a $5 credit at our used bookstore. So that's a nice way for us to keep those 
sort of fresh and fun and then do some things with them. Um, hopefully have it become a community garden exchange a little later on down the line. Wonderful. Um, oops, it's going fast now. I have to, might need help <laughs> keeping up with this. This is fun. Um, let's see. De Delaney says and, and Osceola that they are starting outdoor yoga story time at their main branch. And Maribel said, um, has anyone offered film screening with an inflatable movie screen or other types of portable screens? I, I haven't offered it, but I researched it. Can I offer my findings? Go for it. Um, so as far as outdoor screening, make sure you contact your licensing partner that you do your movie licensing through and make sure they will allow you to screen outdoors or that you pay the extra amount for an outdoor screening for X amount of people. Um, which can get really pricey. Uh, it, I know that when I checked at the height of COVID last year, because we were talking about trying to offer a movie night, a, like a drive-in movie night, um, our license would allow it on our property with less than 50 people, which our library is small, so we would have definitely been okay, uh, but our projector wasn't strong enough um, to, to really handle that um and to allow everyone to be able to see it so space was an issue and things like that but just make sure you check with your licensing for that absolutely good points and i noticed too that you also talked about uh getting permissions for the story walks too and that's really smart as well because copyright is such a big issue isn't it um let's see uh, Michelle said, we're thinking about beginning story times in the local parks. It's a great idea. And Ellen said, I like this one, uh, outdoor story times followed by food truck Fridays. What fun that is, you know, get, get the kids all whatever played out and then eat. <laughs> Oh, Pasco did a drive up outdoor concert. Lovely. Elise, can you talk about that? I don't know if you have a, a mic. I don't, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, Mary Beth might be able to go a little more in detail into that. I was pretty new at the time, but um, I know it was at the Hudson branch and it was, you could just drive up and the band was performing and they were streaming it. Um, Mary Beth, I don't know if you want to elaborate a little bit. Sure. So we had the concert was held on a Friday night at the Hudson Library, which is a fairly large parking lot. We did look into projecting it on an inflatable screen, but that particular day it had been raining and we were concerned that the screen would get wet and there would be problems with drying it out. We have an audio engineer and a videographer already on staff. So we had no issues with getting the sound streamed on an FM transmitter into people's cars. And we also streamed it live on YouTube. Um, they were trying to register people to make sure we had enough space in the parking lot ahead of time. So that was, a, you know, that was a little difficult trying to get all the cars in so that people have space and can see everything. I'm also involved with a local symphony orchestra that has been doing drive-in concerts. This is not library related, and that's key, making sure that you have a seating area where people who can, if they feel comfortable getting out of their cars with masks and social distancing, can actually get out because it can be very difficult to see depending on what the space is. So if anyone has questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Great points. Uh, Teresa mentions the Florida Florida's Project Wild courses. They have fantastic activity ideas, and I highly recommend the workshops slash trainings to get the curriculum books filled with activities. We don't have a lot of outdoor space at our branch, but they can be adapted to indoor areas if need be. But if you have the space, try it out. 
children really need to have environmental education. This is true. Teresa, you want to talk some more about that? Sure. Um, there's a few different ones. It's run by FWC. Um, if you just go on Google Florida Project Wild, um, there's Project Wild and Aquatic Wild, and normally the trainings are in person and outside, but everything's virtual right now, which is nice because anyone can join it. Um, so it's just really fun, and it just teaches kids about local wildlife and different ideas like population genetics and things like that. There's really all different topics and they're preschool age all the way up to high school. So it's just a fun, a fun thing to learn about and incorporate. Agreed. It's uh, nice, it's nice too right now while you're doing all the outdoor programming too. <laughs> yes. I think uh, Leon County did a project while uh, activity as well, didn't you? Whoever is here with Leon County? Is there anybody here? I don't know that they can speak. Um, Casey, did you want to talk about that a little bit? Oh, I can. Um, I was just saying that we, as BLD, we hosted an in person Project Wild uh, training back at the end of 2019, and it's hard to believe it has been that long. Um, but I will say, because I know that not everybody in here does children's programming. So even though um, this is geared towards kids, there's so much information that I think that even those of us, all of us adult learners who were sitting through this, we learned so much. And so I think even if you don't do children's programming, it's a really good Florida based resource, so you could easily take it and adapt the information to to adult patrons in that community or family based uh, patrons as well. And it's great because it is very Florida specific and so it really talks about Florida wildlife. It's wonderful. Um, Namor asks, how do you limit attendance at outdoor story times? Do you mean for story, what do you mean limit attendance? You mean in terms of where you're providing it or if it's like in a sit down place, is that what you mean? Right, right. if it's outdoors, how do you, how do you limit the attendance with social distancing doing COVID-19, or do you take attendance? For folks who have story times, outdoor story times, do you take attendance? Do you limit attendance? How do you social distance? Yeah, and Casey's kind of adding to that. What are your COVID-19 precautions that you take with outdoor story times in the park or at the uh, farmer's market? Anybody have any ideas on that? This is Melissa from Winter Park. I was gonna chime in for the story times that we're doing at the farmer's market. We are asking folks to socially distance and asking for folks to keep their mask on. And we do have the staff member doing the story time and then another staff member to sort of monitor that um, folks are maintaining social distancing and keeping their masks on and it's outside so we feel fairly safe to do that uh, Melissa talks too about uh, pause there Melissa Curry talks about pause therapy dogs coming out um, reader of the pack I love that that's so cute <laughs> um, in our children's garden. Uh, the, weather, the weather had been perfect and everyone seemed to enjoy it. The children can share books with the dogs. Everyone wears masks and we have plenty of hand sanitizer available. We're re we were requiring registration, but that didn't seem to work. Hmm, imagine that. They come and we haven't had too many people show up. I th I'd say you've been lucky, <laughs> Melissa, because I don't know how you would turn people away if they just show up, but no, whatever. Um, 
And then uh, Rebecca says our read therapy won't come out right now because of possibility of passing COVID to the dogs and the handlers. Uh, Ellen says a re outdoor read um, to the dogs and read to the dogs and blues on the lawn concerts. Ooh, nice. Okay. Everybody misses the dogs. <laughs> Casey said that even though Project Y, oh, she already shared that. It's already, it was, it's good for, for all ages, even though it's geared toward children. Um, it's hard to keep, keep up with the chat. Uh, and Delaney says, well, for our yoga story time, we are planning, oops, on having the yoga mats six feet apart and kids over the age of two need to wear masks. Okay. And Kay Evans asks, if you have outdoor story times, do you use any sort of microphone or voice amplifier? What are your recommendations? Anyone have a recommendation? So the link that I posted earlier would be good for something like that because you can charge it and take it out and use it as a battery powered um, microphone little, it's a small PA mm -hmm. um, and it would work well for something like that. We haven't done that. Um, unfortunately for me and our children's staff, we are completely open and having in-person programs um, without being required to be outdoors. Um, but if we were going to be outside, we would definitely be doing that. But I dropped the link for that and the FM transmitter at the beginning of the chat. So if you want to scroll back up, that's a, it's a pretty good one. So. Wonderful. Uh, Clarissa shares that they, um, have everyone register on their webpage and they provide social distance markers on the ground to keep groups separate. We also have hand sanitizing stations. Everyone has to wear a mask and they have staff that monitor. But the, for the most part, everyone is very respectful and follow the rules. We also have mics for staff if needed, but I'm fairly loud. <laughs> well, Clarissa, we haven't heard you on this call though, so we need to hear you. Um, Delaney I'm in a very small brand, so <laughs> I keep my mic used to a minimum. <laughs> I see. Okay. Um, and Delaney shared too that they're doing their yoga um, story time under a pavilion with good acoustics, but otherwise she'd probably bring a portable Bluetooth speaker for uh, music. What do you do in case of bad weather? Do you have a backup date? I don't know about you, but I would definitely have a backup date. <laughs> being being the weather being what it is in Florida, usually unpredictable, uh, having a backup date is probably a good idea. I would I can't. I can't speak for story times, but I know with bingo, it is dependent on the weather being good. So they know it, it's, yeah, it's weather permitting. So if the weather's bad, I'm not gonna be out there under my trunk trying to deal with the PA and hand out bingo cards. We're just, we're just gonna cancel it and it'll be the next one. Mm -hmm. so I'm sure it would probably be the same way with some of these outdoor story times as well too. It would be weather permitting. And yeah, Clarissa from Miami said weather permitting. Yeah. Teresa also shares that they her branch hosts American Sign Language socials. We don't currently have them in person, but it, as it is a visual language, you don't need speakers. What a wonderful idea. 
Has anyone, Casey asks, has anyone been presenting story times at other locations like farms or outdoor museums, et cetera? Have you done that during COVID? Yes, we are making plans to participate in one of our parks is Manatee Appreciation Day next, oh, it's this month. So they're having a manatee themed program outside and we are going to go and read some manatee books as part of this. And it will be fun. Yes. All right, I'm gonna ask a, one last quick question. If you could provide anything outdoors for your community, sky's the limit in terms of staffing, funding, what would you do? What would you like to do? No people have wish lists, right? <laughs> Okay, I can talk again. Um, the new library branch that we are opening in August, this is Pasco, will have an out, a courtyard that's enclosed. It's part of the building. It's got an outdoor stage, and it'll be great to have things out there, story times, yoga, dance party, like Jade said, and concerts. So we're really looking forward to that. Sounds lovely. Um, Let's see, Doris says, Bob Ross painting class. Um, Jade says, dance party for toddlers and preschoolers like we used to. Um, Casey asked, Sarah, I know you do a lot of art programming. Are you planning on doing any outdoors? No plans at this time. We haven't done any outdoor programming at all, so it's still kind of new. So pondering. I see. Uh, Michelle says, fantastic fudge for Valentine's Day, read Arthur's Valentine and then made chocolate caramels. <laughs> Sounds delish. Uh, Teresa would like to host nature-based uh, field trips for schools and homeschooling families. However, we don't have an outdoor area. Maybe you could partner with somebody local. Astronomy program, Mary says, Tai Chi, crafts. Maribel says, dance instruction. Uh, let's see. Oh, Deborah says, so much about my yearning has to be the end of COVID so we can with reasonable certainty. That's very true. Michelle says, ARC wildlife care conservation, read book, read book, Rudolph to the rescue. And Elise says, hosting our fifth annual Aster Geek Fest mini Comic Con. <laughs> that sounds fun. Oh, and Michelle added, with live reindeer. Good golly. Awesome. Any last thoughts that you would like to share or continue this conversation? We can certainly do that. Um, you know, we just want to hear from you and how we can help you. Uh, with your programming, um, but of course, sharing ideas across the state is probably one of the best ways to to share and to learn and to fail sometimes and to say, hey, I tried that, it didn't work, I'm going to try something else. I just would like to Thank you all for joining us today. Um, as I mentioned, the, the recording will be available on BLD's uh, YouTube channel. If you if you have a topic you'd like to us to discuss, please share it. We would love to um, hear from you. And we hope to see you again on April 19th at three o'clock. Until then, be safe and stay healthy. Thank you all.